Oops. <laughs> Let me try that again. I'm sorry. I think we've got most of the technical problems <laughs> solved tonight. And I'm going to presume that you can see that screen and that animal that's been uh, a major part of my professional and personal life for many years. And indeed, I was intrigued with this animal long before I ever saw my first caribou. I was reading Duncan Pride. I was reading Farley Mowat. I was reading George Califf. And I just had to get myself north to see caribou. And I have, and it's been one of my... Uh, uh, pleasures of my life to have worked on this animal. So I'd like to talk about why caribou are so intriguing and what we need to do to conserve caribou. But before we get there, I think we have to delve into one question in particular, and that is caribou. Well, why caribou? Why the disproportionate attention to this animal? And I think the short answer is that caribou have a very close relationship to another species. And that's us. We've had a closer relationship in many ways to caribou than virtually any other animal. And we can see that in our prehistory and our culture today, caribou were the species that allowed for the emergence of modern humans 30,000 years ago in Europe. If we take a look at what people were eating, especially when times were tough, their middens, some of it was 100% caribou. And so it was crucial to human survival. And that was true certainly right up until the 20th century. We can also see the emblems of caribou. In Newfoundland, caribou was on the uniform, emblazoned on the uniform of the Newfoundland Regiment. And caribou was chosen as a symbol to commemorate their fallen. And even today, if you go north, indigenous people in particular, their very identity is caribou. And so this animal has just occupied a disproportionate amount of our attention and for good reason. And by the way, that animal on the 25 cent piece, that's not moose, that's not elk, that's caribou. So place a bet with your uh, niece or nephew and maybe you'll win 25 cents. And so I want to talk about this animal. It's about time we could serve caribou, that's for sure, but it's also about space and scale. And so what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of natural history, some of the intriguing things that, about caribou. We'll talk about caribou as one species, but really two ecotypes, the caribou of the boreal forest, the caribou of the barrens, and then we'll use those as lessons as to how to conserve this animal into the future. So let's start with some natural history. And indeed, one of the most fascinating things about caribou is their ability to move. They are perhaps one of the most mobile pedestrians on the planet. What a fascinating animal. Here's another photo from Bill Duffett, my uh, colleague. And of course, if we have a, I've, I call caribou the masters of movement. They are designed to move literally. They have large hooves, a low foot loading, which allows them to float on snow and in soft uh, tundra, for example. And caribou can move right from the get-go. They have hollow hairs that allow them to swim with their backs right out of the water. And then there's those precocial calves. They're, they're really designed to move. I can assure you that a caribou calf can stand shortly after birth. It can walk within a few hours. And within a few days, it can outrun even the fastest biologist. And so movement is inherent to caribou, how they use space is important to how we conserve them as well. And we know that uh, from some of our more recent work. Here's an animal of the George River caribou herd. She was lovingly known as GR89118. And she was radio collared on the coast of Labrador one year. And look at her track over one year. She walked more than 4,000 kilometers and came back to the same calving location the following spring. So remarkable, just remarkable scale of movement that is, is part and parcel of this animal. 
And one of the expressions that we scientists use of movement is called the home range. The home range is an area that an animal will use over the course of one year. And so this, I like this analysis. Each of those points that you see is a species. And it's a graph of the size of the home range versus the size of the animal, the body mass. And if we take a look at that, on top of that heap, both in absolute terms and relative terms, is caribou. Caribou have the largest home ranges of any terrestrial animal. And often we measure them in the hundreds, thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of square kilometers. So tremendous areas over which they move in the course of one year. Not surprisingly, natural selection has shaped caribou literally to use space efficiently. I like this analysis as well. This is an analysis of 18 different species from sheep to hippos. And you can think of this as the measure of energy expenditure. How far, how much energy it takes to move one kilogram of body mass, one kilometer. And as you can see, that's a function of body size. Larger animals are more efficient. So a hippopotamus, for example, is more efficient than a sheep. But if we take a look at that line, the animal that's furthest below that line, lower than expectation, is caribou. They use less than half, 48% of the energy that you would expect for a 100 kilogram animal. So tremendously efficient in the way that they move and the energy that they save moving across the landscape. And by the way, that species that it's right next to them with a W, what do you think that is? You're saying, hmm, scanning your brain, saying warthogs, white-tailed deer. Well, it's wildebeest that other great migrator that also has been honed again to move with efficiency and low energy expenditure. So caribou are literally designed to move with efficiency. Another interesting feature about caribou is that they have antlers and other deer species, other members of that family have males that carry antlers, but caribou are unique in that females, not all of them, but many of them also carry antlers. That's remarkable because, as you may know, antlers are deciduous. They're cast every year and then need to be regrown. So during the summer, when the dam is needing to mobilize calcium and phosphorus and energy for lactation, for the milk for her calf, she also has to mobilize the energy, calcium and phosphorus to grow antlers. So tremendously energetically expensive for those animals. Why do we think they do that? Well, caribou antlers are great weapons. During the winter, they can defend feeding at sites even against larger unantlered males. And I know that because when I was a teaching assistant some years ago at University of Manitoba, I had to move skulls and other specimens down the hall from where they were stored to the teaching lab. And occasionally I would move a pair of antlers and people would just simply get out of the way in the hallway. So they're a great way to, to move those that don't want to. And so tremendous cost then to having these antlers. And if you have caribou at home, you know about those costs. Oh, have a seat, I'm sorry. Let me clean that off for you. Muffin's been shedding. <laughs> so yes, there's problems with pet caribou and there's a precise etiquette that's grown up as you know, if you get my point. So that pun was intended by the way. Here's the other thing in a sobering way, caribou across Canada are declining I like these maps. I'm gonna show you two maps by Justina Ray. Some of, you who, some of you may know her in particular. Take a look at the different units that we call them of caribou across the country. In 2004, we see a lot of red, a lot of orange on that map. These are the endangered and threatened populations of caribou across the country. Look how this has changed in about a decade or more. More red, more orange. The only group that's really has improved in status are peri caribou at the high Arctic, now threatened instead of endangered, but we have more populations that are closer to extinction. And so caribou, in my view, is one of the most, or perhaps the most daunting conservation challenge that we have. And we can see that in their conservation status across the country. So there's a bit of natural history. Let's talk about this animal though, because caribou classification is complex. And so I just want to make this 
clear because where we draw lines in conservation is important to what we're trying to conserve. Well, here's my take home message on that, is that woodland caribou are not woodland caribou. <laughs> and so we often designate caribou, caribou are one species around the world. So caribou reindeer are one species, but we also designate, as you might know, subspecies. And so Ranger for Tarantus caribou are called woodland caribou, but really they're of two types. The subspecies really doesn't convey the kinds of variety that we see at that unit. And so a major milestone in our understanding was the des designation of two ecotypes. Tom Bergerud was really uh, the pioneer of caribou biology. You're going to see his name and you're going to hear his name several times tonight. What he did was to, dis was to distinguish between what he called sedentary caribou, migratory caribou. And the terms are variable. Sometimes caribou biologists will talk about forest dwelling caribou, woodland caribou, boreal caribou. That's one type. Those are the animals that inhabit the boreal forest year round. On the other hand, he distinguished that from a migratory ecotype. And again, the labels change. Sometimes they're called forest tundra, sometimes bare ground, sometimes coastal. These are the animals that undertake those long migrations and give birth to their calves north of tree line. As the name suggests, the distance that they move is different. So sedentary caribou generally show short distance migrations, migratory caribou, dramatic long distance migrations. But the key feature is what the females do at calving time in spring. When they give birth to their calves, what sedentary caribou do are disperse into the boreal forest. So females space out, as Berger had said, they give birth to their calves in solitude. On the other hand, migratory car caribou just do exactly the opposite. They come together in their thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands, and the females space away, as we call it. They move away from tree line up onto the barrens to give birth to their calves in large numbers. Both of those, we think, are strategies to reduce predation on the calves. Wolves, in particular, are a major predator of caribou, and these are two strategies that caribou use to try to reduce that predation risk. And so where we draw these lines is crucial. Let's take a look at Ontario because traditionally, the province has distinguished between forest dwelling caribou, those are sedentary caribou, and forest tundra caribou, which are the migratory type. That's important. And indeed, just a few years ago, there was a great, a fair bit of controversy about this, especially from uh, some of the forest injuries, for, for example. So take a look at this, uh, some of these headlines, horns locked over caribou data. Well, they're not horns, they're antlers, but <laughs> it's a good try at a pun. But that's a major problem because as the OFIA said, uh, research from the MNRF suggests there's minimal differences between caribou and Ontario. And if there aren't actually two types of caribou, then it's incorrect to designate one of them as threatened. So the implications are immense. Well, that's an important question. And so uh, I, Bruce Pond, some of you may know him, undertook an analysis to see, indeed, do we have one type of caribou in Ontario or two? And so this is some work by the ministry. They deployed radio collars, GPS collars on 140 female caribou across the far north. And in three years, they collected almost a quarter million locations. So there they are there. And what Bruce did was to take a look we take a look at the movements of these animals. Do we see one type, in which case we'd see one bell curve, or do we see two types? Well, not surprisingly, regardless of how we looked at it, it was two types. If we take a look at the annual distance traveled, or the average distance south of the tree line, or the percent of their locations in the Hudson Bay lowlands toward the north, two types, two types, two types. In other words, sedentary caribou, distinguishable, from migratory caribou. So indeed, there's two types of caribou in this province. And the other thing, and I found this in Labrador as well, is that behavior appears to be permanent, at least during the three years where those animals were tracked, we know, saw no switching. Once an animal adopts one strategy, they stay that way and there's no apparent change. And that's consistent with the genetic evidence that suggests these animals split several thousand years ago. So it's not just, it's one species, but it's really two types, as Berger had said. And that's good news because I've structured this whole talk 
around two types of caribou. <laughs> so let's talk about caribou of the Bora Forest. This animal in particular, I think, is the most daunting challenge that we have for many reasons. And I'm going to emphasize here the importance of scale in trying to understand this animal and try to conserve it as well. So we're talking about caribou of the sedentary ecotype. These are animals that spend their entire lives in the Bora Forest. And so we see small bands like this of maybe a dozen or a few dozen animals, not the huge herds that are more typical of the north. And so let's emphasize the importance of space again. Here's some classic work that was done by Kent Brown on the Red Wine Mountains caribou herd of central Labrador. Here are 17 females that he collared. And what we see at calving time in spring when they're giving birth to their calves, these animals space out. If you take a look at the scale of this map, indeed, these animals occupied their entire population range, some 20,000 square kilometers during that time, trying to make themselves rare in the midst of predators. And so a typical density for sedentary caribou is about one animal per 16 square kilometers. So imagine a block of forest, four by four kilometers, you'll find one caribou on average in that area. So large amounts of space are needed. And it's not just any space. Here's some work I did with Bill Pruitt at the University of Manitoba some decades ago. And we were looking at the effects of the Wallace Lake fire, an area that you see here, the hatched area. This is a 60,000 hectare burn. And I looked at the distribution of caribou in winter, four years after fire, five years after fire. And so if you take a close look at that map, you see quite a difference. Four years after fire, there were still a lot of animals within the midst of the burn, but five years later, they shifted a lot of their activity to the Northwest, to forests that were 55 years old. And we concluded that forests less than 50 years old, less than half a century, were not suitable. In other words, caribou require old forests. And there's been some work to co corroborate that since. Sedentary caribou are in trouble. They're a threatened species. Here's the same Red White Mountains caribou herd that I was responsible for in Labrador. And we can see the population estimates through time that show a dramatic change. So up to about in the 1980s, this population was estimated to be about 750 animals. We did an estimate in 1997 that showed 151. So a decline of about three quarters and no indication of, of recovery since that time. And this was some of the reason, some of the evidence about why that species was designated as threatened a few years ago. Perhaps the most sobering case is in Alberta. Take a look at some work by Dave Herview and his colleagues. There's several populations there, and we can take a look at the rate of decline per year. Here's some, here's some herds that appear stable. So there's some uncertainty about their trajectory, but when we take a look at all of them, we see negative growth, negative growth, negative growth. That's a decline. In fact, on average, these populations had been declining by 8% per year. 8% per year means their numbers are being halved about every eight or nine years. And the, the numbers are sobering. That's clearly not sustainable. Populations, once they start to fall, seem to fall inexorably towards disappearance. And so negative population growth indeed is characteristic of many caribou populations across the boreal forest. And here's why, here's Berger again. He said that he understood that the reproductive rate of this animal is low. Caribou have, twinning is very rare in caribou, unlike moose or white-tailed deer, and they won't have a calf every year. And so to make up for that low reproductive rate, the survival of those females in particular must be high. It needs to be on the order of 85 to 90%. So that's a passing grade for caribou for a population to be stable. And so as Tom Berger had said, there's a fine balance between gains and losses in caribou population. It doesn't take much to tip that balance and watch populations slide into decline. This province is no different. Another uh, signature of decline is geographic. So we can take a look at where caribou were. This is some work that's what, 70, more than 70 years old. So some things are older than I am. <laughs> In this case, in particular, we can see that already by 1950, by the late 1940s, the decline of caribou was obvious. So a large area, caribou were absent 
And we've seen that progressive range recession, as they call it, the extirpation or disappearance of caribou uh, going on. And this is not a movement. This is the systematic loss of populations as we've encroached into the boreal forest, caribou disappear. Take a look across the country, you see, we see the same thing. Here is the contemporary range where caribou or woodland caribou can be found now and where their former range was, surprisingly far south, for example, Georgian Bay, for example, that kind of area. They've been extirpated, that's a local extinction, in almost half, 40% of their range where they've disappeared. And so this is continuing, it's one of our signatures of a species in trouble. And so there's no coincidence, in fact, there is a strong geographic coincidence where we see fragmented forests with roads and cut blocks and those wellheads and those kinds of things, we see caribou disappearing. As we move forward, uh, northward rather, to uh, exploit resources, caribou disappear. And indeed, we can take a look at this historically. This has been going on for a long time. The historic range of caribou was surprisingly far south. All the maritime provinces, several New England states, uh, the Gaspé Peninsula and, and et cetera, were part of historic caribou range. And if we take a look at where caribou were last seen, it gives us some indication about how caribou disappeared. And we see this progressive range recession northward. And so the last caribou was seen in Vermont in 1840, New Hampshire, 1881, Maine in 1910, Nova Scotia, 1912, Cape Breton, 1925, New Brunswick, just a couple of years later. And indeed, caribou persisted on Prince Edward Island only to 1873. I tend to think maybe the Fathers of Confederation may have dined on caribou, but it would have been some of the last. And so we have a broad swath in eastern North America, about 400 kilometers wide, virtually devoid of caribou. There's still some remnant populations, like in the Gaspé Z, but they're endangered. They're down to about 48 animals total, and the biologist that works there is not very optimistic about them persisting. So it's a crisis in slow motion. If we look at it from a broad scale, it's obvious to us that this is going on. And a few years ago, I had a student look for caribou place names in that swath. And indeed, there's many caribou Nova Scotia, and there's 10 caribou lakes in northern Ontario that are now out of caribou range. These are remnants, geographic remnants of where that animal used to be. Another sobering thing is that if we take a look at protected areas, even some of our largest protected areas, Quetico Provincial Park, Puckasaw National Park, Banff National Park, caribou have been extirpated there. They've been lost, even though these are areas that are supposedly are intact. So even in thousands of square kilometers, seems to be insufficient uh, in itself to hold on to that species. And so why? Obvious question, why are caribou declining? And let's get right to it, habitat loss. Yes, there's been some indications of overhunting, but by and large, caribou biologists are of consensus, is that habitat loss is the major reason for the decline. So as we encroach into the boreal forest with forest cuts, for example, or roads, we alter that in a subtle way. We make those areas more conducive to other deer species like white-tailed deer and moose. And so we convert what is a, a one prey, one predator system, wolves and caribou, for example, to a one predator, two prey system. And so as a result, we get increases in, in wolves. They can then persist on moose in particular and cause the decline of caribou. And so this can unfold over a few decades, but there's large consensus amongst caribou biologists. This is a series of dominoes, the falling of dominoes that leads to the demise of woodland caribou. And another thing about scales that caribou respond to those habitat losses at, at very large scales. Here's some work that I did with Shane Mahoney in Western Newfoundland, taking a look at the Star Lake hydro development. And Shane was pretty smart, he said, we know this development's going in place, let's treat it as an experiment. And so before the development took place, he had radio collars deployed on caribou. And then we could look at the occupancy of the caribou in the area before construction started and then after construction uh, persisted. And so the Star Lake development was right in the midst of the migratory path of this animal. Here are the results, if you wanna look at it. 
This is, on this graph, this is the proportion of animals at different distances from the project. Zero to three kilometers, three to six, six to nine, nine to 12. Before and after the start of construction. And what we see is a dramatic decline up to three kilometers away from the hydro development. Whereas about half of animals used to go into that area, that declined by 50% once the construction started. And there's even some indication, if you look carefully, perhaps of, of reduced use out to about nine kilometers. And so we call these edge effects. I think intuitively you think edge effects, those must be a few hundred meters. But for caribou, it's often in several kilometers. And we can see that area often two to five kilometers away from roads, away from uh, power lines and those kinds of things. That's the area that caribou tend to use less. It doesn't mean that they don't cross roads, but they simply use them less than we'd expect. So large areas of effective habitat loss occur when we encroach into the boreal forest. And so Jerry Racy said, we should have a broader view of habitat. Jerry was one of my colleagues a few years ago, since retired, but he said this, which I agree with wholeheartedly. He said, yes, we know that caribou often calve on islands. And in a broader sense then, water is caribou habitat. <laughs> and that's true. Without the water, there's no islands. And therefore we need that broader view rather than the, what I call parcel perceptions of habitat. And so recently, the, uh, Environment Canada has been looking at trying to define critical habitat based at the Species of Risk Act. And I like this quote because it gives us a sense of what we need in science. This is from an anonymous uh, scientist, said that emerging problems are more easily dealt with when the basic research has already been done. In recent years, our ability to respond to problems such as mountain pine beetle, SARS, didn't mention COVID-19, has depended on pre-existing research programs. And this is true of woodland caribou as well. The only reason we've come to the uh, conclusions about what's critical habitat is because we had uh, that kind of information, that kind of knowledge in place. And so this is some work that was spearheaded by Environment Canada and Cheryl Johnson in particular. And so caribou are very well studied species. What these authors did was to put together information about disturbance, human disturbance across ranges, right from Labrador all the way to the Northwest Territories. And what they did was to assemble two sources, two kinds of information. One was about population condition. We call it recruitment. Recruitment is the addition of new animals into a population. So recru high recruitment is good. It means the population is growing. Low recruitment means the populations in trouble. And what they did was to relate that to habitat condition. So the degree of human disturbance, anthropogenic disturbance between those two. And we would expect something like this. In other words, where we have high disturbance, we have low recruitment. Where we have an intact range, low disturbance, we would expect high recruitment, a population is doing well. Well, expectation sometimes actually coincides with the data. And so, <clears throat> Each of these dots here is a population. And indeed, we see that relationship. Fire has a bit of a, a, a relationship here, but really the driver of recruitment, the driver of population growth, the driver of threatened status is human disturbance. The more disturbed the range, the lower the recruitment, and the light, more likely the population is gonna disappear. Just for illustrative purposes, I picked out two such populations here. There's the lac Joseph herd, this is in Western Labrador, next to the Red Wine Mountains herd. There is a map of its range. The red there is fire, so lightly burned area. And there's one rail line, a road, and that's about it with regard to um, the intactness of the habitat. So largely intact. Compare that to the other end of the spectrum. The Little Smoky herd is in great trouble in Alberta. And the area that you see there has been burned, but it's also been affected with cut blocks wellheads, seismic lines, roads. And so no, no surprise, that population's in trouble. Its recruitment is dismal. And without some, uh, without some um, more effective measures, we could expect that population to disappear. The other is that we can use this graph, I think, to give us some guidance. There's the thinking out there that, oh, to keep caribou, we're gonna have to set everything off as a park. Well, that's not true. 
because we look at this, it suggests that we know about 30 or so uh, calves per 100 feet cows, that's a measure of recruitment, is about what's needed for a stable population, which suggests that perhaps an upper limit of about one fifth of a caribou's range could be disturbed. So yes, we can have resource development, but the pace of it is going to have to slow. So some good guidance about what we need to keep care of. Okay, let's move to the other side now, caribou the barrens. And I'm gonna, well, emphasize the importance of scale again. So these are the caribou that people often think of, the great throngs of animals. This is a, this is a photo from my um, colleague, Serge Couturier in Quebec. And so sometimes we see thousands of animals in one such group, the migratory ecotype, these great herds that inhabit the north. And indeed across North America, Canada and Alaska, we have some of the great caribou herds, the porcupine herd, which is the one that crosses the Yukon Alaska border, and also the George River herd in the east. Let's, and what you see there are the ranges of those populations and the darker areas, those are the calving grounds, the areas that females go to repeatedly. And so I'd like to talk to you about the George River caribou herd. This is the herd that I studied in Labrador when I was there in the 1990s. And it occupies a huge area. Caribou do not respect provincial borders, for example. So <laughs> it, was a, it was a shared resource, if you want to put it that way, between Quebec and Labrador. And Bergerud, he was the person that named the George River herd, the George River herd. And he understood as early as 1967 that this would be a test case of our understanding of caribou, a unique opportunity, he said, to explore natural population controls. Let me show you that. So in 1967, this is what we knew about the herd size. It was about less than 50,000 animals when it was first census in 1954, and it showed some growth. And so this is what Berger knew back in 1967. Let me show you the rise of the herd. Here it is here. And indeed, I had to blow the top off that graph. We had never seen this before. For every caribou that was around in the 1950s, there were at least 100 by the early 1990s. The population grew to almost 800,000 individuals. And we had never seen this as scientists. Remarkable growth of about 11% per year. And by the way, if you're getting 11% per year on your stocks, I'd like to talk to you after this. <laughs> so remarkable growth that we'd never seen before. Just to give you a sense of this, if this is the size of the herd in 1954, by 1993, that was it. So tremendous explosion of animals and a growth that was indeed the world's largest caribou herd at that time. Well, no caribou population grows forever. No population grows forever. And so the caribou herd has also fallen. And here it is here. The steepness of that descent I think surprised me in particular. I, I thought the caribou population would decline, but not to the extent it has. From 800,000, the population has declined to less than 8,000. So a 99% decline in just a couple of decades. And by the way, that is not the reason I left Labrador. <laughs> and so a 99% decline, this population is actually designated as endangered now, something that we never would have thought it happened. And so let's just take this and turn it around. By 2018, this is the caribou population that we have now in that part of the world. And so the question is why? Why did this population quit growing? This is a question of biologists, they call regulatory factors. And I'll show you just a few bits of evidence. This is some work by Serge Couturier looking at jawbone length. So we take a look at animals that are harvested. We can measure the length of their jawbone. That gives a good estimation of body size. And as the population grew, we see a decline, a remarkable about one and a half millimeters per year, down, 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 down. In other words, caribou were getting smaller. As their numbers grew, they were getting smaller in stature. They since rebounded, but during that growth period, there was certainly a decline in size. The other, and this is from work from Bergerud as well, is that as that herd grew and females went repeatedly to those calving grounds, we saw grazing and trampling of that core summer range. More broken twigs, more turf, less lichen, less birch. In other words, by repeatedly going to the same calving grounds, females in particular 
were grazing and trampling their very food. And so this was revolutionary at the time, is that we think intuitively, it must be winter that regulates populations. For migratory caribou, we found it's summer food. The return, the repeated the return to traditional calving grounds put a lid on population growth and at least initiated that decline as well. So that was revolutionary when it first came out. Berger was such a smart fellow. He also said, well, that's more recent, but what about back in time? And so if we take a look, no surprise, when caribou grew in numbers, they also expanded their range. And so we think populations often inhabit a core range, as you see here. And what you see here are progressive expansion of that range as the population grew in size, we saw areas that hadn't seen caribou likely for decades. So larger and larger numbers leading to larger and larger ranges. Well, Tom Berger was pretty smart. He said, we could use that. We could go back in time and at least get a qualitative sense of caribou numbers. In other words, if people were seeing caribou in the great numbers along this part of the world in uh, the uh, coast of Hudson Bay, it's likely that there were a lot of caribou. And so he did that. I'm gonna show you a graph. I made the graph, but he did the work. Here's what we think the population size did over the last few centuries, something like that. In other words, people were seeing in the middle of the 20th century, or sorry, middle of the 18th century, lots of reports of caribou from Moravian missionary journals, from Hudson Bay Company journals, a decline, another peak at the beginning of the 20th century, and then another decline at the beginning of the 20th century. That goes with, from what I understand, indigenous knowledge as well, Inu people of Labrador starved at the beginning of the 20th century and species like wolverines and brown bears went extinct at the same time. And so cycles perhaps, but certainly fluctuations are over the course of decades and centuries is really typical for migratory caribou. And we have even more in interesting evidence. Here's some work by Serge Payette. He said, okay, one of the things that caribou do is leave a telltale sign of trampling. When they cross an area such as over here, they'll often, their hooves will do damage to the roots of tamarack and black spruce trees. Well, you can put a timestamp to that. And so what he did was to collect these areas, of these trees, and look for what he called trampling scars. And here you can see one from 1904 and another one from 1973. What he did was to do that across Quebec Labrador, and you can see some measure of caribou abundance. Here's the most recent rise. And what it suggests, just as we saw before, is a decline at the beginning of the 20th century. Again, more evidence that indeed, caribou rise and fall over the course beyond our lifetimes. And so I love this quote from J. George Careleff. He says, caribou herds, they're like a geological force as they flow over the land. They dominate the landscape and the lives of people who hunt and depend on them. Indeed, an, a population of several hundred thousand will eat millions of kilograms of forage in one year and deposit nutrients in the form of fecal pellets in their millions of kilograms as well. I like this photo by Dil Bill Duffett. So one of the things we know about caribou antlers is they're high in calcium and they're, they're cast every year. And so probably at its peak, there may have been um, half a million or more pairs of caribou antlers being deposited across that landscape. We can only imagine the geological force that's associated with that. So there's what we know about the biology of this animal. What does it mean then to conserve it? Well, let's get to that. And I'm gonna emphasize not only what we know about caribou, but what we might learn from caribou. And so one of the things I think that's obvious is that the idea of limitless abundance, it's time to dispense with that. It's a human trait, I think, that goes back a long, long way. But we have lessons from George River caribou, from Plains bison, from passenger pigeons, from white pine, species that we thought, northern cod, that we thought were limitless in their abundance, but we need to learn that lesson for starters. The other is that the way we frame a problem often leads us to particular solutions or perhaps not solutions. So here was a serious proposal. I don't think it's gone through. To save woodland caribou, 
the province of Alberta wanted to build a large fenced enclosure, get rid of the predators, and then we'd have caribou. Well, that's called a halfway technology. We know that wolves and bears are not the ultimate cause of caribou decline. It's the habitat loss. It's our roads, our wellheads, our cut blocks, those kinds of things. And so, yes, we can have caribou go to the zoo in Peterborough. You'll see reindeer, caribou. We can put a fence around them and feed them hay, but that's not what we're asking for. We want caribou as prey, as herbivores, as carrion, as and all their other ecological roles. And so jobs, there's a lot of concern about caribou versus jobs. I like this quote. Jane Lubchenco wasn't talking about caribou here, but I think what she said is relevant. She said, the false assertion that we must choose between the economy and the environment is often made, but it's not. It's a false dichotomy. The real choice is between short-term gain and long-term sustained prosperity. If we keep caribou, we think of them as an opportunity, then I think we're much more likely to go to the long-term sustained prosperity. And I know, I used to live in Shefferville, Quebec. I know what it's like for a, a, northern popula a northern town to lose its livelihood. And so caribou, yes, we can keep them, provided we look for the long-term. And indeed, we're taught that from young age, aren't we? Here's my guess. I'm gonna show you a little bit of literature by an author called Richard Scarry. You know him <laughs> from your childhood. This is from Richard Scarry's ABCs. And it's just about the perils of short-term thinking. And so H is for hole. Haggis has a hole in his roof. He never fixed it because on rainy days, it's too wet to work. And on sunny days, well, it doesn't need fixing. <laughs> and so short-term thinking indeed has its perils. And that's true when we go to conservation as well. And so what we might learn from caribou, I think is at least as important as what we've learned about caribou. You and I, as uh, Anthony King said, are prisoners of perspective. We stay pretty close to home and we our adult lives, half a century, perhaps a little bit more. But if we're gonna conserve caribou, we're gonna to need to break out of those shackles. It means vast spaces. We have to move beyond what we call par what I call parcel perceptions of habitat and think about whole landscapes, whole watersheds, because that's the scale at which caribou move. And it's also about time. Keeping caribou means long time frames beyond multi-year plans, be even beyond our individual careers or lifetime. If we embrace a, a far-sighted view, then I'm quite optimistic about caribou and their conservation. Well, I was told to end a talk at one time by my supervisor, Bill Pruitt, with a sunset shot. And so let me show you that one. And indeed, I got the animal in it as well. So I think that's not too bad. <laughs> Thank you very much.